Uh, we are now going to introduce USF as one of our partners and then move on to our first speaker. So University of San Francisco Sport Management Program has been educating sports industry professionals since 1991. The University of San Francisco has established itself as one of the leading sport management master's programs in the world. Their locations in San Francisco and Orange County give students broad access to opportunity and their track record of placing students and getting them connected to professionals gives them a great insider advantage. For more information about USF Sports Management Program, visit the sportingglobal.com page to find the link to their homepage. With that being said, I have the pleasure of introducing our first speaker, who in fact is also a professor and director of academic programs for the University of San Francisco Sport Management Program. So Dr. Daniel Rasher is president and founder of Sports Economics LLC and partner at SOSKR LLC, where he has published research and consulted for hundreds of sports clients, including the NBA, NFL, MLB, NHL, NCAA, NASCAR, MLS, and many other big players in the world of sport. He received his PhD in economics from UC Berkeley, and he is also director of academic programs, like I mentioned, at the University of San Francisco Sport Management Program. Reminder to everyone to type your questions in the chat box for the Q&A session following Dr. Daniel Rasher's presentation. And without any further ado, Dr. Daniel Rasher, thank you for joining us here today. Christian, uh, thank you for introducing me, and Ole, thanks for putting this together, you guys. I'm really excited, and I'm, I'm glad to see uh, this, this uh, organization take off um, from a, a student project at one point at the University of San Francisco. All right, let me share my screen, and we'll get started. So I wanted to talk about something that might be obvious to all of us, which is the importance of using data and making decisions. And I wanted to do that by going over some actual case studies on projects that, that I've worked on. I think we we, we, we tend to hear a lot from um, corporations that are focused on a particular topic uh, in data science. And my background, um, as Christian said, is sort of working with different clients who have data science needs uh, that that tend to come and go. And so I'm going to go over some examples and then hopefully I'll um, be able to answer some questions that you guys have. So, uh, the application of data science to the business of sports can change the direction of firms and the decisions by regulators and courts. And so these are some of the examples that I'll, I'll dive into them. And so I won't go over these right uh, a second, uh, but you can see sort of some, some of my clients are are plaintiffs or defendants in lawsuits that require a deep dive into the data. Other clients are uh, an NHL club, for instance, or um, Power Five football program interested in understanding their nature of competition, their fan base, uh, etc. So, first example is a class of college athletes had sued the NCAA um, in order to allow the universities to to offer them a bigger scholarship if they wanted to, not sort of forcing the universities, but allowing them to. And in that process, a question came up uh, because of a statute of limitations, how, um, how, you know, which universities would have done this had they been allowed to going back to 2009. And so we took data from the 2015-16 season, gathering data from each of the major, um, you, each of the major universities, their scholarship usage, recruiting success, revenues, expenses. You know, we gathered that data through discovery. We gathered it through through public sources, and we used that model to create uh, a forecast. And it was 94% accurate about which schools would have paid these athletes. And that led to, I think, was the important part here because it had an impact. It led to a $208 million settlement that you can see there at the bottom of the screen. Um, those payments averaged around $4,000 per athlete. Uh, those athletes re were receiving those checks over the last um, few years. Um, and so that was a use of, of data science to sort of backcast what would have happened in the past had, had a rule change been allowed. Um, also in college sports, some of you may have followed the FBI's investigation 
of uh, college basketball and uh, some of the shoe companies making payments to the families of of star high school basketball players in order to entice them to attend universities that uh, who who wore those shoes. A question came up um, from one of the the uh, Adidas employees. Uh, he wanted to explain to the court that he was providing value to these universities because if he delivered them a five star a high school basketball player um, that they would uh, make millions of dollars um, per year in additional revenue. Um, and so he, in, in his eyes, he wasn't defrauding them. He was he was providing them um, something of, of high value. And so part of our analysis looked at that question. And you can see here in the middle that that we find that there's about a 7% increase in, in basketball revenue uh, for schools that are able to to land a five star prospect. There's only about two dozen of those every year coming out of high school. So these are quite coveted athletes. Um, and so part of his point again in that case was 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 to to show the court that he was providing value. He, he wasn't defrauding uh, these universities. And so uh, again, sort of using using this this data science, this econometric analysis to 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 answer a question for the court. Um, in part of a study for an NHL club, they were worried about an NBA team moving into their market. So they needed to understand if that team moved into their market, what sort of uh, business impact would it have on them? And so we, as part of that process, we conducted a study looking at, um, we, we kind of followed the natural experiment of when the NHL was locked out and looked at how it affected attendance at uh, competitive situations. So NBA teams, minor league hockey teams, et cetera, to sort of see um, if there would be an impact. And you can see at the bottom, there is definitely a statistically significant impact, um, but it's not very large, right? So it's sort of single digit, 5%, 6% for, 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 for minor league hockey, you know, 3% for the NBA. So, so this, this, um, so when we kind of sort of plug that into some of the data that the, uh, that the NHL club had and, and effectively said, okay, what if your attendance drops by a little bit, is that going to be a problem? And so we use that uh, as, as helping them with their business planning. As it turns out, the NBA team didn't move into their town, and so there wasn't really a problem uh, in the end. Um, when Tom Brady, about 10 years ago, uh, in the process of the NFL Players Association ne negotiating with the NFL, um, he decertified the union and sued on antitrust grounds. And one of the questions that arose in that case was how uh, important was revenue sharing to profits for NHL clubs, but also did revenue sharing uh, lower the incentive for these clubs to go after players? So the players felt that if there was so much revenue sharing going on amongst the, the owners that they had less of an incentive to go out and sign players because it didn't matter in a sense. If they won, they would still share in those same sort of revenues. And so this is a term that 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 we call the free rider effect, where some clubs chose not to spend that much money on players because they would make high profits anyway. And so if you take a look at this graph, all it's really showing you is that if you move to the left, which is paying less and less for players, you end up with higher profits. So it really does show that in the NFL uh, at the time, the incentive was to really the financial incentive was to pay less for players so you would make a higher uh, profit. Now, if we dive a little deeper into that data, you can see that, um, in fact, winning is profitable, in a sense, losing is profitable, and kind of finishing in the middle is not because you end up spending a lot of money anyway trying to get there. And so in that, in that Brady case, they were able to use this as an argument to allow the players to have, a say, players to have a say in the revenue sharing um, policy essentially that the NFL had. And prior to that, the, the, the NFL was sort of claiming that revenue sharing wasn't part of the collective bargaining negotiation. So Ticketmaster, right? Many of us in North America are familiar with Ticketmaster. They, they control around 75, 80% of the primary ticket market. Uh, it wasn't that long ago when they started to make inroads into the secondary market, the reseller market that StubHub and others had 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 sort of created or formalized uh, using technology. 
um, StubHub had noted that Ticketmaster was conducting some experiments with some concerts where they would keep the ticket tied to a credit card. And if you wanted to resell it, you, you didn't have a physical piece of paper. You had to go and resell it through Ticketmaster's website. Um, allowing Ticketmaster to sort of control the secondary market and, and effectively cutting out StubHub and other resellers. And so a natural experiment took place at these Michael Buble concerts. And so we were able to, to use that data. We scraped 1,600 uh, tickets off of the internet in terms of their, their data. The, the, the tickets were still there, but we scraped the data. And we were sort of testing this experiment. I won't go into the details of, 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 of how the experiment worked, but I'll show you what, what the results were. The results were exactly what one might expect. For the control groups that we had, yeah. the higher quality seats tend to, to resell more often, right? That's sort of what we expect to see, and, it, and we tested that, and that was, in fact, the case. With these um, restricted tickets, in fact, hardly any of them sold relative to uh, the lower quality seats. And so that's exactly what you'd imagine in a, in a mon monopolistic situation, is you would imagine a restriction in the quantity sold, and a higher price, and in fact, the price of these tickets were vastly higher than um, would otherwise have been the case when we look at the control group. And so we were able to to provide this information to StubHub um, and help them lobby some of the state's attorney generals to change their laws to sort of force Ticketmaster to allow someone, if they wanted to, to resell their ticket on a different platform and not have to go through Ticketmaster's platform. Um, and so today that sort of has spread uh, across um, the United States. And so even if you have sort of a restricted ticket that that you that they claim you have to resell on a particular platform, you're actually able to detach it and and, and in most states and sell it on a uh, on any, you know, any platform you want, uh, therefore providing more competition in the marketplace. Um, Two more examples. This this next one, I, I found a pretty interesting one in that we were working for the for NASCAR um, in a, a lawsuit involving the Kentucky Speedway. The Kentucky Speedway had spent $200 million investing in its facility and wanted to force NASCAR to give it a race. And NASCAR said, no, we get to control which races we um, or where, where we put our races. In that process, there was an analysis looking at the payments that NASCAR makes to the different tracks in order to host the race. And there was a claim that um, NASCAR was favoring certain tracks. And if you run sort of a blind uh, econometric model, in fact, there was sort of an upward slope in the data. And so the conclusion at one point was that yes, NASCAR is favoring these tracks. But if you look closer at the data, you see that Daytona is really the reason for that up to apparent uptick. And Daytona is really the Super Bowl of NASCAR. And so when you when you control for that as a separate indicator variable, you increase your goodness of fit by around 40 percentage points. In other words, you really explain the model better. And then you end up with a situation where it doesn't look like NASCAR was favoring any of the tracks. And in fact, that led that was one of two reasons that that led the judge to essentially throw the case out and allow NASCAR to choose um, which tracks it sends its uh, its races to. And then finally, um, a Power 5 school recognized, which I think is quite obvious to, to, to most organizations, that its fan base is, is filled with different types of, of, of fans who are interested in different things. Some are more interested in the experience. Some are more interested in the actual football on the field. Some care about the food. Some care about convenience, and so we we did a cluster analysis of 2,800 of their fans, um, and 95% of fans sort of fit into one of these five clusters, and they were able to use that information to reset up how they targeted their their customers and what they offered, what sort of ticket packages they offered. And so briefly, I'll just kind of show you how we describe the clusters. There was the high income critics who were, as I said, very high income. They were not satisfied with hardly anything. <laughs> they were critical of crowds, customer service, and so forth. Um, then there was the older experiential seekers who were less likely to be related to the university as an alum or, or faculty or staff. 
uh, they tended to be older and were really there just to sort of experience something, just to go out to, a, to, to an event that may be nearby them. Um, price sensitive, health conscious fund seekers tended to be younger. They tended to, to, to more often be women. They were only buying kind of one ticket at a time. Uh, they enjoyed sort of the atmosphere around the game and, and as, as much as they really enjoyed the game itself. Um, and then the fourth group were sort of mimics of the high income uh, uh, critics at the at the beginning. 16 percent of the, of the fans were these single game middle income critics. Um, and again, they typically had a child or something, and so they could only attend one or two games a year. Same thing. They were they were quite critical of, of much of the experience. Um, and then you had sort of the core football fan, which which I fall into. I just want to go to the game and watch and cheer, and I don't really care about anything else that's going on. Um, and yet that only makes up about 20 percent of the fan base um, of this um, of this school. And so, it, you know, it's important for that school to understand that they have these different targets. And so they were able to use that to put together different uh, ticket packages and everything. And so I think these are just some examples um, that we all need to to really dive into the data, see what it tells us, twist it, bend it, chop it up, and really sort of try to understand, um, you know, how to help our, our clients um, do a better job at what they're trying to do. So thank you very much.